it's finally arrived. Bios Genesis, the molecular arms race game. One of the latest of a few designs released here by Phil Eklund. Uh, he also put out Pax Renaissance uh, he did with his uh, son Matt. And also the Kyber Knives expansion. I have some of that stuff over there. Here's my basement, by the way. It's a, it's a gaming basement. There's my TV. Uh, you can't quite, maybe you can see it there. There's Pax Renaissance. I also have Greenland Pax Premier there. I got the expansion Kyber Knives, but this is the one I think that's been getting a lot of attention. Um, Pax Renaissance 2, but this one I think is, is the long awaited uh, Genesis game from Phil Eklund. And I've had a chance, I've had it here for about a week. I've had a chance to kind of play through it a few times. And I thought I would like to do a sort of introductory video to go over how the game works, some of the components. Uh, I don't, you know, not necessarily doing a full playthrough, although I might do that. But let's just sort of talk about how the cards interact, what you're going to do in your turn, and uh, break it down. Because although the rulebook is, uh, actually it's really nice by the way, it's really like high glossy paper. I, I'm sure some people find that really annoying because they like to mark in their rulebooks or whatnot, but uh, maybe that's a wargamer thing, I don't know. But the rulebook is quite large and has a lot of, uh, of sub points and different things that go in and out of it. So the first glance, of course, you're, you would probably think, oh my goodness, this is going to be a very daunting uh, undertaking to play this game. But it actually rolls pretty well. Uh, that's pretty fun. No pun intended. It is a dice game. Uh, it actually, once you start playing, you can actually get through the turns fairly easily. There are some interesting nuances, of course, in the actions allowed. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Uh, again, I've only played three games, so it's not like I'm the master of strategy, but I've seen enough to understand uh, some basic ideas of what you want to do. So yeah, let's take a look at some of the basic uh, cards we have here. Okay, that's the rulebook. It's nice. I will say this is, again, a standard Eklund rulebook. It is very thorough. It is written uh, sort of like almost like a technical manual in a sense. Uh, everything is, is there's no space wasted. <laughs> it's a very efficient rulebook. And uh, that can be maddening or great, depending on your point of view. Uh, what I mean by that is that you will need to read the entire rulebook, including the glossary, if you want to get um, the full rules, <laughs> if you want to understand everything that's going on. For example, if you want to learn about atrophy, you need to come read about the atrophy rules there. Um, if you want to start learning about, uh, geez, how certain things work. Like one good example we'll talk about is when you lose a mutation, I had to read in the uh, glossary that the mutation actually goes back into the... Uh, lower part of the deck of the of the bacteria where your home row is from. We're going to talk about that just in a second, but that's one little example of something you need to read the complete rulebook for. So yeah, spend some time with it if you get it, or look over the living rules, because of course there's already been modifications, so this book is already out of date. Uh, not necessarily a lot, and in fact you could play the game pretty much completely as it is here. You would only have maybe a few points of confusion, but it's totally playable. I don't want to make it sound like you can't play the game, but as if you play Eklund games, and you probably know that living rules are the... Uh, are the way it goes and it's already being changed and modified and examples are being clarified and such that things like that so go online check out the sierra madre website they do have the living rules there um and uh yeah so you can get started if you don't have the game or just sort of catch up on some points if you have started playing it and uh, you want to see what the latest rulings have been so anyway yeah rule book okay what's the point of the game well it's a game about making life and as such you start off as some pretty basic things there are four players in this game you can play one to four uh, I'm going to talk about the game in the four-player mode. There are certain different rules for playing with less players. Uh, I've only done the four-player uh, sort of solo as sort of a schizophrenic player, playing each person to the best of my abilities. Uh, there is no hidden information in this game uh, other than what's in your own head. So it makes for a good solo experience in that way. But there are solo-specific rules in the rulebook. Um, I want to make that very clear. There are very specific ways to play a, an, an intentionally solo game. Okay. But what I'm going to explain today is going to be sort of the overview as if you had four uh, human players, or if you're just going to play this, as a lot of people probably do, uh, one person split into four minds. Okay. So you get four players, and what do you start off with? Well, you get these sort of virus cards. Um, these are going to be, or I'm sorry, parasite cards. I say that one's a virus, but they're actually they're parasites. And these are going to be helpful for when anybody puts a bacteria card into play. This is going to let you sort of jump into that, and we'll talk about that in a second. But anyway, you can see here we have four players according to colors. We have, what is it, the nucleic acid is the blue. The sort of, um, what is this, the, oh, I forget. This is like the lipids, I believe, is the yellow, right? The red is going to be the um, proteins, and then you're going to get your pigments from green. Um, you don't really necessarily need to know that, uh, but it does sort of make thematic sense when you see what these various colors do, because each one has sort of its own special ability that it's going to confer uh, when you start making life. So when you start the game, what you're going to come with is you're going to get basically three bionts. These are going to be sort of what I would classify as sort of the sparks of life you're going to be distributing throughout the uh, 
the board as it develops and also into your own bacteria life forms and maybe if you're conniving enough into your uh, other players life forms. Uh, these biomes are limited in number. There are rules about how you place them. We'll talk about that in a second. The goal will be eventually is that you're going to have to essentially survive three different eras of Earth's development. You're going to start over here in the uh, uh, Hadean. I'm probably totally mispronouncing that, sorry. Uh, the Archaean. And then you're also going to get to the uh, Proterozoic era. Uh, essentially, this, if you played any sort of Eklund games and you know this sort of works, you turn the card over, you sort of resolve the events, and then you make your decisions and cho choices and purchases and all that stuff on the map. What will happen is, is that over the course of the game, we'll start sort of in the Hadron. Let's just go ahead and flip one over, right? Oh, that's a big whack. We'll come back in a second. So let's say you get this card, right? So you turn it over. Now you're going to notice a couple of things on the card. First, there's like a wonderful little paragraph that sort of describes what that card means. And that's, that's very helpful. In fact, this game is definitely heavy on the science. Uh, that's really great. You don't necessarily need to know it to play the game or understand what's going on. But if you are into biology or biochemistry or into a sort of the early development of the Earth, there's a lot of here for you. Uh, there are a lot of great things to read. So the card's pretty simple. It's going to give you the turn order at the top. It's going to tell you the events that you're going to have to deal with before you can make your purchases or moves. And it's also going to tell you which of the four um, landforms are going to be active that turn. And that's sort of important in terms of placing your biomes, uh, making moves, and things like that. And also in terms of uh, mutations. We're going to talk about that in just a second. So there are four uh, landforms. There are the cosmic landform. You have the ocean landform followed by the coastal, and then finally continent landform. And as you flip the cards, different landforms will go active. So right here with the bro um, brolide water delivery, we can see that the oceanic la uh, landform would go active. And all that means is you would take this card and say, it's got its nice colorful side. Uh, we'll explain more about what active uh, rows mean, but that's where the first part of this card. The way you introduce um, various things that you can get your life started on, because right now the Earth is sort of a... Uh, so nothing's really going on. There's no place for life to start. But if we start with this card, for example, as our first event, you'll see some of the icons here. There'll be a few. There are ones like this that come with the blue. That sort of means, uh, well, he calls them the heaven cards. I think Phil Eklund says these are the, the heaven and earth uh, generating events. These represent sort of outside events hitting the earth or bringing, you know, asteroids and whatnot. Dust, all that jazz. Um, I'm trying to think if there's a tectonic one in this or not. And that's going to be the red card. Maybe not, because these are all like outer space. Okay, here we go. So if you go in the next era, you'll start seeing cards that are tectonic cards. Essentially, these are how you get new um, landform um, refugia into play. Okay, that's what these bigger cards are called. The placards underneath these are called refugia. And these are places where life essentially can begin to start because it has sort of the necessary... Um, shall we say components, right? If you if you sort of remember your old time biology, you might think primordial soup. Yeah, there's a warm pond card in here. That definitely is a place where that can happen. But there's also, let's say, a pumice raft. We also have the clay mound and something like interplanetary dust. So these will all come out because as you turn these cards over, they'll dictate sort of when you bring them out, okay? So let's say we'll go back to our beginning here. Let's say we started with this card, right? And we have these two heaven cards. So that means what you look at is you look at which uh, landforms are active on the card. In this case, it's going to be only the oceanic one. And uh, with the heaven cards, what you do is you take, depending on the number of them here, so we have two, you would take two refugia from the topmost active landforms. So that might be the cosmic dust, it might be a cosmic one, it might be in this case the ocean. If we had multiple ones active, or even just like, let's say these were all inactive, but the continental one was active. Technically, it is the highest one active, and you would draw two from that. Um, if you get the tectonic one, which is that red one I just buried way down here, which is the red one there, that means you, you take a refugia off the lowest active landform mass, which again, theoretically could be a cosmic one. <laughs> because that could be the only active. It's possible. Not likely, I don't think, but it is possible. So essentially, you're going to flip these cards over. You're going to see which landforms are active. And if they're active and have one of these cards, you're going to start putting out new refugia. So if we had that one card that said, hey, ocean is active, and we're going to put out two refugia, you would simply be like, clay mound comes out here, green rust fumarole comes out here, okay? This is where you're going to start placing your biomes. It is where players start competing to generate bacteria, which is sort of the, uh, what is that, the microorganism that leads you towards the eventual goal. If you can or lucky enough, start developing macroorganisms. We'll talk about those in just a second. So if you get a refugee out, the first thing you do is you look at it and you say, okay, lots of information on the card. What are we talking about here? Well, essentially, this is where you're going to start putting your biomes, and it's where you start rolling dice to get sort of the, the life started. 
When you first put a, a refugee a card out, you're going to want to look down here at the mana structure. We got tells you what kind of cubes are going to come onto it in the disorganized area. So this one comes with a red, a yellow, and two blue. Ignore the dots. I'll talk about that in just a second. What that means is essentially when you start a new refugee, you're going to come out here and say, oh, this is the suit, by the way, your sort of tokens. You have two different kinds of tokens in this game. You have the discs and the cubes. They mean, they mean different things. If you play Declan games, they mean different things when put on different cards. So we'll talk about that in a second, but that is the basic components. You have cubes, uh, discs, and also these little domes. Okay. On a refugia, cubes become known as mana. And mana is sort of like, just like it sounds like, the very basic building block of life. Um, so in this case, when you put this one out, it will get a yellow cube. It's gonna get two blue cubes. One-handed. blue, and then it also gets a red, right? Once you've placed all these out according to events and you've, and you've resolved all the events you have to deal with, and we'll talk more about this in just a second, resolving some of the other ones, then when it comes to your assignment phase, what you do is you'll take your bionts, depending on the player order, right, dictated by the card, you get to move through and assign your bionts. And so if you had these two active and red went first, red might say, oh yeah, I'm going to go the clay mound. And what happens is you'll put it in the organized area, and then everybody will assign their bionts. And then once that's done, you're going to start rolling uh, to see if you're actually able to take some of this disorganized mana and move it to the top where it becomes organized, because organized allows you to um, begin to form more robust life, okay? There are issues if you have, say, competing bionts on there, let's say, when there's only a few, especially in the beginning of the game, there's a lot of competition to put different things different places. You might get like three people in one space, right? So there's three bionts there at the top. And uh, in that case, what you want to do is you want to see who controls that bionts, who's going to be sort of the, the dictator. I forget the exact term they use. Um, that's pretty bad because I want to try to use the exact terms. But essentially, it's the person who's going to control what happens on that card. Because when we get to the end of everybody assigning their bionts, that's when we roll and kind of see what kind of results we get from people being on that and sparking life. And, and we're going to see if anything really comes about it. But essentially, you don't roll for each player. You just roll for each Refugia with bionts on it. That's why it's important to see who makes the decisions. The way you can tell who's in charge of any refugia is you simply say who has the most amount of organized uh, cubes and or domes. Right now there's no cubes up there because we haven't activated any, but if we look here, everybody's tied, right? There's just one bion of each color. That's when you come down and look at the mana structure and you say, okay, well, we've got three of them, but red is here and red is at the very beginning. You start looking at this list, right? So if red was here and there was a tie, then red gets to go for, or red gets to make the decisions essentially. If red wasn't here and it was just blue and yellow, then we see that yellow would actually make the decisions, right? Because, you know, uh, they, they actually come first before blue does in the structure. Now, if it was, you know, say blue and green, right, on the clay mound, in this case, blue would go first, and we know that because even though there is no green mana cube, that's what the dot sort of indicates. It's, it's like the player order uh, for the card itself, and, and that's why you'll see some cards that have different dots on them, because they didn't get a red cube, but there might become a case where yellow and red are competing here, and in that case, yellow would have the advantage in ties. Um, the way you sort of dictate who else besides having just these bions, these bions count as one, you also look at potential enzymes that you might put on the card, and those come from your discs that you will accumulate. We'll talk about that in a second, but you can place those, and those count as something, as, as numbers towards your total. So if we had uh, this situation going on, we wouldn't even have to look at the mana structure because automatically yellow has the advantage. It's got one bion and one enzyme of its color. Uh, on the on the refugia. You also look at any cubes that may have been accumulated, right? So we'll talk about that in a second too. So in this case, if we had this going on again, yellow would clearly rule. But if we had like this going on, right? And we had red biont, red cube, yellow biont, yellow enzyme. Well, red gets to go first because red has two, yellow has two, and red is the first in the line, right? So that's how you decide who kind of makes decisions when you do rolls on the refugia. All right, so when you start the game, everybody gets three of these bionts, and they also get one with, it's called a catalyst when you don't put it on anything, and it just sort of sits in your tableau pool. So each player will have their own sort of, you know, tableau area, right? And the yellow will start off with three bionts, and a yellow catalyst, blue with three bionts, and a blue catalyst, and green, and, and red, and so on. Sorry, red and green, and so on. These things do different things depending on what, you, what card you put them on. They essentially are the currency of the game. They allow you to buy upgrades. They allow you to sort of also improve your refugia so that you don't suffer as many catastrophic uh, die rolls uh, and things of that nature. 
Uh, they also can help improve your macroorganisms and your microorganisms, giving them vitamins and antioxidants. That helps with O2 spikes. We'll talk about that in just a second. Let's say you put all your guys here, and let's say, let's simplify this down. Let's just say like blue and green are competing. Okay, if blue and green are competing here, if you look on this dice, what will happen is when it comes time to roll for the refugia, you count the total number of cubes and domes on here, and you roll that many dice, with domes uh, equaling two. So refugia, I mean, sorry, your bionts, which are these things, right? That's sort of how you get the spark going. So if you only had uh, one bionts on here, you would roll two dice when you're trying to decide what happens on this refugia, because that one bionts equals two dice. If we had three bionts on there, oops, rolling around. That would be six dice, C246. If we had a couple of cubes up here and those, this would be, what is that, eight, right? So you get two for each of the bionts, but one for each cube, essentially. So that would be rolling uh, eight dice. Now, like I said, when you start off with the refugia, all the mana gets put on the disorganized side. Where'd that red guy go? Oh, there's a red cube. I was like, where'd the red cube go? All that mana starts on disorganized side. And when you roll on the uh, refugia, after everybody's assigned their bionts, right, and then you go through the rolling phase, what you're looking for is essentially successes, right? And so there's going to be different either hot or cold temperatures of the earth. This will be decided by the event cards you draw. You can see here we've got some cold ones. There will be hot ones that show up too. Um, so if it was, say, cold for this round, then a clay mound success roll would just be a one or a two, right? You'd have to roll that. If it was warm, it could be a one, two, or three. And you look down here at sort of this next row. I forget what this row is actually called, but it's like it's the enzyme row, essentially. And what you do is you'll take your catalyst if you want to. When you assign your bionts, you can also spend your catalyst to sort of block up these holes. And what you can see here is that if you roll, say, a four, five, or six, and none of these are blocked off. So let's say I'm rolling for the clay mound. I'm going to roll four dice because i got two bionts each. And uh, blue is going to make all the decisions. We'll talk about that in a second, right? Because they're one each, but blue wins because it's in the, in the, uh, the order there. It breaks the ties. You're going to roll four dice. If I roll, let's say, four dice and I get two ones and two fives. Well, I did get two successes because I rolled two ones, right? And even in the cold or warm, a one is success. And each success allows you to move one cube from disorganized side to the organized side. So if I rolled two successes, I could be like, oh, I want a blue and a red cube to come up. But I also rolled two fives. Now, if you look here at the fives, you can see a five has a sort of a cube downward arrow and a C plus. What that means is for every five you roll, you have to take a mana uh, in the organized spot, and uh, that it can also be a bionte, and you have to move it to the disorganized side. If you do so, you get a catalyst of that color. And this is how you sort of generate income in the beginning of the game, because you only start off with one catalyst. You have to sort of, and that's why you have to assign your bionts here, sort of get successful rolls to move them up and then move them down so you can start creating more catalysts so you can sort of lock these up and hopefully what you want to do is be able to get enough up here that you can start life but this is the first way you start making sort of currency in the game is is having these bionts come to life and then die <laughs> it's, it's a very interesting sort of a life death cycle so in this case like i said we rolled those two those two go up and then we had two fives well i need to get rid of two uh i could get rid of those two cubes if i do so then i get a blue catalyst and a red catalyst um, on contested refugia, like I said, the person who's in charge makes decisions, and what that means is they get to decide which cubes come up, which cubes go down, but they don't get the benefit of that stuff necessarily. Any cube that they send down, if it's contested, so right here we got a blue and green are contesting this clay mound, and let's say I roll the two ones and two fives here. So as the blue player, I'm like, cool, I'm going to bring up my blue and red cube because I want that. Now I have to send two cubes down because I rolled two fives, right? So I could choose to send both these down like this. If I did that, I would have to give a red catalyst and a blue catalyst to the green player. Or if there were, say, a yellow player here as well, that's not red, so um, I'll mess it all up. But let's say that happened. I would have to give those two to him because anytime there's contested, the leader, the decision maker, has to give all the sort of spoils of the catalyst uh, gaining to other people. You could also choose as a leader to say, no, I think I'm going to get rid of this green biont because uh, this can cause nasty things when you're trying to make macro, when you're trying to make microorganisms and you have biont's here. I'll talk about that. You don't necessarily want to be sharing your gene pool with other people. You kind of do sometimes, but if you want to get the most victory points, you want to just sort of do it on your own and you don't want a lot of uh, other people contaminating or cluttering your, your organisms you're trying to make. In that case, if I had two losses, I could say, nope, green's going to go down. And actually, when green, anytime one of your bionts moves from organized to disorganized, it just goes back to your tableau, and you get a catalyst uh, as a sort of a compensation for having to disappear. 
So it would go from here to here, green would get a green catalyst, I could then also remove one more, and then a green would get a red catalyst as well. That would leave blue here with just, uh, you know, with a nice organized cube and its own buy out there. So the next round, uh, maybe if no one else places it there, I get to roll three dice, right? Two for here and one for having that already established. So generating mana to organize side gives you more dice. Having organized mana go to disorganize gives you catalysts. And you can also assign and move your own buy-ons or others, if you're the decision maker, to the disorganized side um, in order to get yourself a, comp a compens you know, to compensate yourself, you get a nice little uh, catalyst token. That's essentially how you start uh, making money and also generating what you need to make life. Because if you see in the top right of the card, we have the two symbols there. That means if you roll doubles, you can make a bacteria out of this card. Um, oh, I forgot to talk about this. The whole reason you would even want to cover up these slots down here, the whole reason you want to generate catalysts and have this sort of currency, is that one way you can spend it is to cover up these, these tokens, right? You can start filling in the holes on your turn, and you can fill up as many as you want as long as you have catalysts um, to spend, right? And anybody can put any amount, any color of any time they want. Well, during the, the allocation phase, they can put them down. What that does is if it's covered, so let's say we have these all covered up, let's bring a few guys out, right? Let's say over time, this refugee has been having a lot of uh, catalysts put on it. They become enzymes. Now when we roll, we still have the success rolls up there dictated by the temperature, but sort of our death uh, rolls become now just sixes. Only when we roll a six do we suffer any kind of negative consequences. One is gonna be a catalyst, so if you roll a six, then we have to get rid of one mana, it has to go from the organized, disorganized side, and you get a catalyst. Also, this other one means enzyme death, or yeah, enzyme dies off. So every six we roll, we have to get rid of one of our stored enzymes. So if I rolled two sixes, for example, I would have to get rid of both these because I have to get rid of two cubes from the organized, disorganized side, and I would have to get rid of two of these, right? So then two of these would go away, thus revealing the five, meaning next round a five or a six would get rid of a, would make me have to sacrifice some mana to the disorganized side, and, uh, and so on, you kind of get it. If they're all filled up, well, then that refugia becomes pretty much um, immune to any sort of negative effects. You're basically only going to be able to organize mana, and then you can start creating life if you roll doubles. Uh, there is one way enzymes can go away, and that is through an event that will happen, uh, UV exposure. Let's see if I can find one. Not UV, I'm sorry, a smite event, which essentially is going to be different, like... Is there a smite event? There we go. Anytime you find one of these sort of like BP looking uh, icons here, I don't know, that makes me think of the corporation BP. Anytime you get one of those, it does remove either uh, the furthest rightmost enzyme on a card, or if there's no enzymes, it starts removing mana. And this is, you'll see a lot of these come through the game, and this is one way your refugees start really just taking hits and losing mana, and it makes creating life more difficult. Uh, because if you don't know anything about this game, making life is a difficult endeavor and risky. So let's say we have all this competition going on, we've managed to do this or whatever, it doesn't matter on the type of the enzyme, so if they're all full and we have this, let's say uh, through some sort of good luck, Blue has been able to get this as their final roll. And they rolled doubles. If they roll doubles, what they do is they can flip this card over and create uh, a microorganism. When you do that, disorganized mana goes away, all your little catalysts you spent to become enzymes, they don't mean anything anymore, they go away. But any organized mana and any bionts in the organized side stay. And what happens is you'll take these and you'll flip this card. Now it goes into your tableau and you have formed basically a microorganism, this nice little bacteria card. Now all the, the refugia will form the same microorganism. They do it through different ways. That's explained here at the top. And this is where the sciencey part is cool. Like if you want to know how this GNA lipid world, you know, or guard marine bacteria forms, how it gets energy, boom, there you go. But this uh, diagram at the bottom is the same for everybody. And when you make life, you take all of your organized cubes and bionts that you had surviving, right? And you place them on here, and this is called your starting chromosomes, okay? So we had two blues, we had a yellow, we had a red, okay? If we had made life, there was a green biont, say, in the organized side, and we weren't able to get rid of it through... Um, through like we were saying when you roll like a five or six, or when you have this catalyst sort of exchange of mana to disorganize for catalyst, right? If you weren't able to get rid of it through that, and it remained on the card when you make life, then it comes into your organism as a um, as sort of a foreign gene, but it helps you out, right? It becomes a chromosome, but this is now a foreign gene. Um, this gives the green, let's say, let's say blue player made this life, and green was just on, you know, sort of was just there for the ride. 
Blue is in control of this organism, but there comes a time when you can make purchases for any organism, and as long as you have a biont in that organism, you can make purchases for it too. So blue would get like sort of potentially maybe first dibs depending on the player order, right? So if in this case, it would go red, yellow, blue, green. Blue would get the first chance to purchase things for it, but then when green's turn came, because it has a biont in there, it can also make purchases for this organism as well. That's important in terms of competition because maybe you want to slip into somebody's organism and use up all the resources uh, so that they can't really improve their life form while maybe you have another one over here that you're, you're focusing on and you're going to make great, right? Um, but you're going to try sabotage. That's one thing you could do. Um, you could also help cooperate and help buy good things for this organism. So essentially having two buy-ons in it lets it buy twice. Um, that's, that can be very helpful if you're doing a cooperative game or if you're just trying to make a more complex life form. Because the sooner you can start getting this rolling, the sooner you can start getting to uh, the marine life here, the very simple sort of uh, macro organisms. And the sooner you do that, you can start filling in their cubes and then you can make higher VP terrestrial organisms, right? Like snails. Um, so yeah, when you start off on the refugia, you want to organize mana. If you organize enough mana and get doubles, you can start making bacteria. When you start making bacteria, you have to go through and get mutations, which you can buy over here on the side of the decks. And as you buy those, you get more cubes, more chromosomes, and eventually if you get enough, you can start making life. And, and the way you can see that, as you see here, it says on the side here, you would need one blue, one green, two yellow, and one red. If you had all those kind of chromosomes, you could, on your turn, pay to make lamp shells. Okay. How close would we be on this bacteria? Well, we got the one red, we have the one yellow, we have the blue and the green. The only thing we're missing is another yellow. If we were able to get one more yellow chromosome, we could purchase the lamp shells for our bacteria here. Now that sounds pretty easy. Okay, I made bacteria. All I gotta do is purchase upgrades. By the way, you purchase upgrades with, you guessed it, your catalyst, right, that you get. Catalysts come from not only when mana gets disorganized on refugia that you uh, roll on, but also when you make life, we'll talk about this, there are other rules you can make and you can start generating energy through um, uh, your own sort of um, auto catalyst rules. And we'll talk about that. I guess we should talk about that now. So we've made sort of this bacteria. The way the game sort of works is turn over the event. Sorry, <laughs> this is all sort of disorganized. I'm trying to do it in one take, so you can tell I'm a little disorganized. You resolve all the events that you go through your deck, right? Then you assign all your bionts that you want to do. And, and part of that assignment can include putting viruses. Now that there's a bacteria, we'll talk about that. You can start, or not viruses, parasites. You can start putting them on other micro or macro organisms. Uh, you can also assign your catalyst as enzymes on refugia. So you do all that. When you do that, then you do all the rolls to see if there's any going to be any life made or sort of disorganization of mana to create catalysts. And then if you decide to make life and you make a microorganism, the next phase is called a Darwin roll. A Darwin roll essentially is just like it sounds like. It's an attempt to see if your organism can keep it together because as a microorganism without all sort of the adaptations that macroorganisms have like DNA, and self-correcting uh, various proteins and whatnot, um, your life can go astray over 200 million years because every turn in this game is 200 million years. Every event card you flip, 200 million years. Kind of gives you some perspective on it. When, you're, when you have a life form live for five turns and then die, well, it did live for um, one billion years. That's pretty good. Okay, what is a Darwin roll? When it comes to do Darwin rolls, you do it by player order on the card. Okay, so let's say this was blues, right? And we were on, I keep looking at the wrong, like multiple events. Let's just focus on this top one. In this case, red would go first if it had life, yellow would go first, then blue. Let's say no one had life but blue right now. So blue has this you know, bacteria here, this GNA lipid world. What it does is it counts all the cubes and domes on its card. For this example, we're gonna go ahead and just remove the green and make it real simple. In this case, it has what? Three cubes and a biont. Again, the dome counts as, uh, as a chromosome, right? Because anytime a cube or a dome is on this bacteria card, they're called chromosomes, right? Uh, so that counts as two, like it did with the bionts when you put them on the refugia, it counts as two. Um, when you roll dice. So that's two dice, one die, one die, one die. Just like when you were rolling for refugia, every dome costs two or gives you two dice and every cube gives you one. Same thing happens here with your Darwin roll. So we would roll what? One, two, three, four, five dice total. You roll the dice and you see the results. Now here's the things you're looking for. You're looking for ones. If you have a red cube, then for every one you roll, in this case, I would generate one blue catalyst, okay? That's pretty helpful. Also, if I roll any triples, I get one catalyst of that color, right? And each bacteria makes different uh, catalysts. This one makes blue, other ones make red and green and yellow. It's, it's the whole spectrum, right? If I roll a five or a six, 
then that's a hereditary issue. Like my basically, I'm just I'm not reproducing correctly or I'm not making good copies. Uh, for every five or six I roll, then I can suffer potentially an atrophy. Okay, this is sort of my withering away. You can negate that by having hereditary chromosomes. So for every chromosome you have in here, then you can negate one five or six roll. Okay, so if I rolled, let's say I'm rolling five dice here and I roll two sixes out of all my five dice, then I'm okay because I still have two hereditary chromosomes that protects me. It's also possible that I could re-roll a die for every yellow cube I have, and that can be really helpful too. So if I roll, let's say, three sixes, well, yeah, I get two protected here, but that third one I re-roll and I get like a three, then I'm safe. Red lets you generate energy. The green lets you put more bionts on more organisms. So there is a limit at the beginning of the game. You can only have one bionts, your little starting three, right? Only one can be assigned to a refugia in the beginning because you have to establish more... Um, essentially green chromosome its organisms. So if you build a bacteria and get a green cube, then you can start putting your bionts, you can put two of them on say one card, or you can mix and match depending on what's available, instead of being restricted to only one. They call that the entropy limit. It's not a big deal until you actually make life and then the first person to make life or get their parasite out, for example, um, that gives them the advantage in the sense that they can start concentrating their dice on certain refugia, right, that come out. So if you had the pumice raft and we had the radioactive beach out here, you might want to, and it's, it's cold, maybe this is the only available sort of refugia that's attractive to you, you might want to put both your bionts on there so you can get four dice instead of just two, right? If they had no organized mana there, you would, you would just have to use your bionts. It helps you concentrate. So getting green lets you have more bionts on different stuff. In the beginning, you can only have one because you literally have no green chromosomes, right? So that's sort of the Darwin rules, and that's where you generate energy is by rolling ones or triples, and then you sort of suffer ill effects by having either, by basically suffering hereditary problems. See, that's why you want to start getting a couple of blues. And this is sort of the crux of the game, is that you want to create life off the refugia, but you want to do so under sort of advantageous conditions for yourself, because anytime you roll doubles, yeah, you could start life, but if, for example, in this card, you know, if we had only this blue bion on it, you know, and after, the, after we do all the catalyst and enzyme death stuff, you know, when we're done with that, we wanted to make life, but all we had was this. Well, that's fine. You know, you can make life because you roll doubles, but the only thing you're going to get is this one blue chromosome in your starting organism. And that's not going to be great because you have to roll two dice for having a bion, right? So if I rolled um, two sixes, well, I can protect myself against one or two fives or six. Let's say I rolled a five and a six. Well, I can protect myself against one, but I can't protect myself against the other. And for every one I can't protect against, I have to, I have to suffer atrophy, which means I lose one cube or biont. If you lose the biont off your card, it's considered extinct. This goes extinct. It just, I, you know, belly up, bloop. You get one VP for it and it can never come back, okay? That's why it's kind of important when you're starting off to make sure you get a couple of cubes in your organized mana area, area when you're trying to make life. That way you can get hopefully like two or three different chromosomes on there so it's a little bit more robust of an organism. Um, because there's also other things that can kill you besides sort of rolling fives or sixes. As we turn events over in the game, various other ailments will come up. So this is a drought icon. If we had a terrestrial life form, so you start off as sort of a sea-based life form, and if you're good enough, you can upgrade it to terrestrial. Um, they suffer drought effects. So there's ways to negate it, but they can suffer that. And if you can't protect that, they lose an organ or, or a cube. Basically, they suffer atrophy effects. Okay. There's also oxygen spikes. O2 becomes a big problem for organisms because oxygen is poisonous for most organisms unless you can handle it. And uh, the way you handle it here is that you need to have green cubes. So green cubes let you not only increase your entropy limit and place more bionts, but for every green cube they have in an organism, it acts as a shield, an O2 shield, okay? So if I had two green cubes on there, then I could, then this two O2 effect, no big deal, I would live through it. But let's say I only had one green cube on here, let's do that so I don't look like I'm hammering away, right? If I only have one greed cube on there and this 202 event comes up, well, yeah, I'm protected by that one, you know, oxygen problem, but then I also have to suffer uh, atrophy because I can't stop both. So let's say that happens and I have to take an atrophy. Well, I have to pick one of my cubes to go away and maybe it has to be this yellow because I'm like, oh, or maybe it's a blue because I already have a blue, right? So, well, there goes blue. Well, now I'm down to just one hereditary chromosome. So oxygen can kill you. Um, hereditary chromosome rules can kill you on the Darwin rules. Also another thing that can get you is heat. Any one of these icons comes up, that is, that means temperature change, extreme temperature change. 
And the way you negate those is having red chromosomes. So for every one of these, you can negate, that's why those little shield icons are there, you can negate one heat um, icon. So it'd be okay for this one, but if I had another one come up that created, say, two heat, uh, then I would, again, suffer atrophy, right? Because this could protect one, but then I'd have to answer by doing that. And this is how your organism slowly wither away until there's just your biont left, and then it can go away, and that's how things go extinct. You can also make your organism more robust by buying mutations. This is a big part of the game. So after we do our Darwin rules for every organism, and we roll for all the cubes and see if we... Um, suffer any sort of hereditary effects or get uh, energy from our chromosomes and all that stuff from our red chromosomes. Then you can spend uh, your catalyst to buy upgrades. The only upgrade you can buy is in active rows, which are determined by the event cards here, and also a home row of any organism you have. So let's say you had this organism here in the oceans, uh, but the oceans wasn't active this turn. Let's say the card came up and made it inactive. You could still buy a mutation in this row because you have a card from this row. Otherwise, you're limited to what's active. You can only buy from what's active. And there are certain other benefits in the game lets you buy from any other row. We'll talk about that in a second. But the standard rules say you can only buy uh, mutations from rows that are active. So if I had this organism and let's say the continent landform was active, I could buy this ribosome RNA upgrade. Uh, that would cost me one red catalyst. You have to pay the color of the band at the top. If you don't have that color, you can spend two of any other color to buy it. It's sort of inefficiently buying it, but it can be done. You would then take that card, come back to your bacteria, and you would gain a uh, red cube immediately because it's sort of an upgrade. So now if I had the same organism, right? I love taking all the cubes away. Let's say we just had this organism to start with and it didn't have any red, you know, no uh, metabolism chromosomes, which kind of is a, a big deal. You need to start getting those so you can make... So when you do your Darwin rolls and you get the ones or the triples, you can make catalysts. Catalysts are the money. Uh, and getting catalysts from mana disorganization is not very efficient or easy to do. This is pretty much a better way to do it, is making life and having red chromosomes. So let's say we didn't have that, and I'm like, oh man, I really need to start making energy, and I'm kind of afraid of getting heat effects. I want to protect against that. So this upgrade becomes immediately awesome because, one, I get a red cube for it. That counts as a chromosome. So boom, I've already increased my chromosomes and now I've got just inherent heat shield. But I've also gotten some upgrades due to my uh, ribosome RNA. So one thing I've gotten here is I've also picked up an oxygen shield. That's very helpful. I picked up this sort of spore icon. This lets me buy upgrades from any row. Doesn't matter if it's active or not. So that can be very helpful as well. And it also has what we call a red queen. And a red queen is sort of an ability that lets you help, help you steal back cubes if parasites jump onto you. Uh, it helps you take them back, and, and we'll talk about that probably right now because we'll talk about getting more mutations and whatnot. So you can buy a mutation. You can only make one purchase every round unless you have the fusion ability, which is, again, a little upgrade you can purchase if you have that card or that icon on one of your cards. Then you can make two purchases, but essentially you can make only one purchase a turn. If I purchase this one turn, the next turn comes around and I survive my Darwin rules once again, and also, I should note, if you, get, if you add a mutation, then that also adds a cube, thus it adds a dice for your Darwin rule, right? So we, we would have here one, two, three, four, five, okay? So that would be five dice we'd roll. If we didn't have the mutation, it would just be four, right? So I purchased this, a whole turn goes by, I let another, I survive my rolls, and we go to the purchase phase again. I can now upgrade this one more time by paying another red catalyst, right? I would have to have a red or two of the other color. I can then flip it and it becomes fully evolved, right? This is a fully upgraded mutation. I now get a second cube, a yellow cube. So it lets me do re-rolls, right? That's helpful. And the abilities change. So I also get, still have the red queen, that's nice. Uh, now I have sort of a sex icon. That means that when I purchase an upgrade, I can, instead of taking the top one, because you can only take the top card, I can instead royal it, which means I can put that card on the bottom and see the next card and purchase that one instead. Let's see what else we have. We also get the DNA ability because this is a DNA strand. Our, our organism is getting more complex. And what that means is, is that instead of five or sixes causing atrophies on, her, on the Darwin roll, only sixes do. Uh, that's pretty helpful as well. And you can see this one caused an, an O2 spike. There are a lot of cards, not only on events that cause O2 spikes. I believe the green parasite always causes an O2 spike because it's, it's one of the original, the pigments are what create energy. And, and anyway, we could go more into that. O2 spikes essentially launch an O2 attack on every organism in your home row. 
So let's say there were lots of other, let's say other players had coastal organisms and I put this upgrade and it gives an O2 spike. Well, everybody suffers an O2 spike. Um, the severity is based on how many green chromosomes your organism currently has. So this O2 spike would only be a level one O2 spike and it would tackle, it would attack every organism in the oceanic life form. Um, that can be very helpful for getting rid of your uh, competitors. It can also be helpful for stealing or taking out parasites. So let's talk about parasites here. As your bacteria gets more upgrades, let's go ahead and just randomly grab another one. Just say let's has this one, right? So you've, you're developing, you've managed to survive rules, not that easy, but let's say you've done it and you're, you're getting close to getting to the point where you wanna start thinking, hey, I'm getting close to making a, a marine animal or a marine, not an animal, a life form, right? I'm getting close to macroorganism stage. Well, you're doing pretty well here, and you're going to get lots of points if you can manage to get to a macroorganism. They're worth a lot of more victory points than just standard bacteria. But other your other opponents might see that, and they might want to launch their parasites against you. So let's go ahead and take a look at... Yeah, no, 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 we want, like, this one. No. Yeah, okay. Oh, it's not good. Well, we'll pretend. So you, you can't parasite your own organisms. So, like, if you had a blue bacteria, you can't put your own parasite on your own thing. Uh, you can do a parasite on a parasite, but you can't parasite your own organism. You have to choose others. So let's say this was green's bacteria, right? And blue's turn comes up. And in the phase where you assign your biomes on the refugia, you can also assign parasites to uh, micro or macro organisms. You must have a biont because it does require a little bit of spark of life to get this going, right? So you take that, you put that there, and then what you do is you steal diseased cubes of those colors from the mutations of the, of the organism. You can't touch its inherent chromosomes, but you can grab the mutations. So here you would see a red and a yellow. It could grab, you know, maybe this red and yellow, right? It might also just grab this red and this yellow. It can choose whatever it wants to do. Okay. Now, you still get the benefits of having these cards, but you don't get the benefits of the chromosomes on them because they're now diseased. So essentially the, the, the parasite gets the benefit of those, but you don't. So the reason that's important is now when we roll Darwin rolls, we only roll ones we have control of. So we get one, two, three, four, five. And when it, But if we had these cubes right, if they were still on our cards, then we would have what? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven dice we could roll. We would have three re-rolls, and a heat shield. But if this uh, parasite comes and steals that, well, suddenly we've lost our red thing, so our bacteria now no longer has its inherent heat shield ability or its ability to make uh, energy on ones. It also loses one of its re-roll dice. So it doesn't really, it gets these abilities, but it doesn't get to like have the chromosome abilities, right? One thing that's important is because, let's say I bought this upgrade and it makes an O2 spike. Well, it's going to attack this parasite, because this parasite is considered an organism in the row of, of, of my bacteria, right? Because it's attached to it. Now, this parasite doesn't have a green chromosome, and green chromosomes, I'm sorry, green chromosomes, that's the one that protects you against O2 spikes. So if an O2 spike of a level one severity happened, I would have to lose a cube here. It'd have to be atrophied, because it's just like a bacteria. If I can't satisfy uh, the heat requirements or the oxygen requirements, I have to atrophy. In that case, I might say, ugh, goodbye yellow cube. Now, if that was, say, the only yellow cube from this upgrade, like this bat, this parasite had come here and stolen this cube from this mutation and then had to lose it through atrophy, this mutation goes away. If you lose the cube that it's attached to, if your bacteria loses it, or if you lose it as a, uh, if you're, I'm sorry, if the parasite loses it or the bacteria loses it through roll, it just goes away. It goes back to the deck. And what happens is you would actually take it and put it at the bottom of the deck in the coastal region because your bacteria was coastal and so or oceanic. So you'd go up here and put it at the bottom of the oceanic deck. So parasites are really annoying because not only do they take resources from you, but they could potentially, through their own mismanagement, through their own bad rules, destroy your mutations you've been trying to buy and, and upgrade your, your uh, bacteria with. Parasites make Darwin rolls themselves. So when you're back, so when we do the Darwin roll phase, you're rolling for this. The moment you after you roll for your bacteria, you immediately roll for the attached parasite. Same rules apply. You get two dice and one for every cube, two for the bions, one for every cube. And they go through the same things. They have to avoid fives and sixes. They can negate them with blue chromosomes. So if we had a heat problem come up on an event, let's say we drew an event that had there we go, like one extreme temperature thing. This parasite could withstand it because it does have a red chromosome. If it, said, if it instead had only the yellow chromosome, then it wouldn't be able to withstand that heat attack because it doesn't have a red, it would have to suffer atrophy and lose that. If it suffers enough atrophies that it removes its biont, it's extinct. 
But instead of uh, it going away forever, it just goes back to be used again. Like these essentially can be used over and over and over. If your bacteria goes extinct, it never comes back. You just get one victory point for having it and you've just sort of blown away a refugia and, and not done much with it. But it is one way you get a victory point. Okay, so we've talked about O2 spikes. Uh, those can be pretty devastating for organisms. It can be devastating for you and bacteria may purchase an O2 spike to kill off your organism because the thing is, is that as long as you have a bacteria on you, when you make purchases, so you do your Darwin rules, it does its Darwin rules, okay? If it somehow makes energy on its Darwin rule, let's say it has this one here, like it has a red chromosome and it rolls a one, then it makes uh, energy for you here. It always generates things for you here. It can only spend your resources here. Um, that's a pretty interesting rule too. Parasites have to spend resources of the, of the organism they're attached to. They don't spend their own player's resources. Um, so yeah, after you do that, and then we do the purchases phase, the bacteria can make its purchases but then, uh, I'm sorry, yeah, bacteria makes some purchase, but the parasite can then do its own purchase using your resources. So if you had a bunch of, you know, catalysts down here, you had a red and a green, it could spend it to buy a red one or a green one, provided all the rules apply, right? You purchase from an active row or from a row that is your home organism's row. Uh, let's say that this, this thing's, you know, we've got this uh, bacteria here, they've made their purchase, and... Uh, you know, this virus is like, I need some better mutations myself. It can spend its its uh, host catalyst and grab legal mutations, and then you add those over here to the left, right? So then it gets a mutation, so it gets a cube now. And so on. Just like you would do for your bacteria here, this upgrades your parasite as well. So now this parasite has a blue chromosome, a red chromosome, and a green chromosome, and it has these upgrades. So it can start stealing cubes with a red queen attack, it can, this HGT allows you to move uh, bions between organisms. That's a pretty obscure rule, but it, it, there is possible to have your bions trapped. Like we said, when you make life, let's say you were in the organized mana area, and uh, I don't know why I put that green there. He should have actually sit over there. And let's say you had this sort of organism, and it's this is green's bacteria, but blue is now trapped in here. If, if blue somehow wanted to get rid of this, they would have to find a mutation that had this HGT on it. And if it did, then it could safely move its, its bion out. Because once it's in a bacteria, it's trapped there unless it gets uh, uh, removed through atrophy effects. Okay, so you can purchase upgrades for your bacteria. That makes them stronger and more capable and willing to take down the host. Ultimately, you might go, well, what's the point of being a bacteria if you're just going to weaken and hurt the other player? Well, eventually, if this player does go macro, if this person gets enough uh, chromosomes, they can do their own macro uh, evolution, right, or turn over the macro. Well, it doesn't turn over. What happens is you sort of pick the macro card you can afford, and you'll put it on top. Then, if there's a bacteria here, and it's on this, and it's been able, or this, sorry, bacteria, why I keep saying that? If this parasite was on this bacteria, then when, it go, when the bacteria goes macro, this um, biont that was located on it, right, would get to now jump into the macro, and essentially you split victory points when it, it has its own gene in there. So that's one reason why you want to have a parasite is because it um, can allow you to hedge your bets or weaken another player if they're kind of running away with a good organism. It can also let you sort of jump on their coattails, and when they go macro, they have to put you into their organism as well, and then you get victory points. You can just share victory points based on that. The goal of the game is, of course, to amass the most victory points. You get a victory point for every extinct bacteria you have, if you have living bacteria, then you get a point for every cube or biont you have on it. If you have a macroorganism, then you get a victory point for sort of the base or the, these cubes on the side, the sort of prerequisites you had to have to make it. And then you also get a point for every other additional cube or biont you have on it. If it is the highest level organism, so that's the tropic level here, when you make sort of macro and microorganisms, you decide, uh, you assign what tropic level they are. The first one becomes a plant. And then as you sort of evolve organisms with higher um, metabolic rates, and that is measured through the addition of red or yellow cubes, then the higher metabolic rate uh, organism will get a higher level of the food chain. So we have carnivore, herbivore, plant. And these are all worth bonus uh, victory points if you have an organism at the, at, the at the top of the chain, essentially. Okay. So you want to make organisms, which is very difficult to do, and you want to make organisms that can get to the highest part of the chain to get the most points. Now, playing this game a few times, it is very difficult, I can tell you, to not only keep your bacteria alive, but also get to even a marine state, much less terrestrial. It's very difficult. Uh, you need to have a lot of good things go your way or good rolls. It's very difficult to do this without having a foreign player get their own biont into your organism and thus sharing VPs. Uh, it is possible through some abilities um, to remove that biont. That is very difficult to do. You would need to get uh, an immunology ability. Let me see if I can find that real quick. 
anything with a sort of syringe icon, that gives you immunology. And what that means is that when you are forced to atrophy things due to losses by heat, oxygen attacks, or this hereditary rolls, uh, you can decide the order. There is a very specific order of how you get rid of things. Essentially, it goes mutations, healthy mutations, healthy chromosomes, then disease mutations and disease chromosomes, and then bions. But if you have the immunology ability, then you can choose what goes first. So let's say I had immunology on my organism. You know, one of my up there are mutations that give you immunology. It's not just a terrestrial or, or marine life thing. Um, there are mutations that do that. If I had that and I suffered an atrophy effect, I could decide to lose a foreign player's bion first. That's very helpful. That can be very helpful if you want to get rid of them. But it's pretty difficult to do. So you're going to be playing a lot of these games that if you get to the life stage, yeah, you're going to be sharing life. And it also makes parasite play very important. You want to make sure you put your parasite on a good organism. If you, if you think it has a good shot of becoming macro, you want to get on that. Uh, there are ways to supplant a parasite. Uh, other players can try to knock you off, and when the way that works is, is that they have to essentially, let's say you had this. If you have a parasite with two cubes on it, it's never leaving. It can never be supplanted. But if through either atrophy rolls, or if an organism uses its red queen to steal back disease cubes, that's what red queens let you do. They'll let you steal disease cubes, or lets you, if you're a bacteria, steal healthy cubes and put them on your uh, cards. That's pretty nice. Essentially, if there's one cube here, then if you have a virus that can steal two cubes from either the mutations of the bacteria or the mutations of the virus, you can knock off that virus and take it over and, and become the more dominant virus. Um, so if you have a virus here that's got no cubes on it, I'm sorry, this should actually always have a blue bion. You should always have a bion on it. If it had no cubes, then if I had a virus that could even steal one cube, I could supplant it. Um, but if it's got two cubes on it, it's a fully healthy virus, then you're not going to be able to knock it off. If you have a virus on an organism, you can put a virus, or why do I keep saying virus? A parasite. If you have a parasite on an organism, you can do what they call hyperparasites, which is put a parasite at the end. And that can come over here, and it can buy its own mutations, and it sucks off the mutations of the parasite here. And essentially, this can be a way to weaken a parasite. This is the one rule where if this was Blue's organism, Blue's organism, and let's say, oh, I mean, let's say this was Green's organism, and blue had this parasite on it. Well, green could launch a hyperparasite on this guy and try to attack it, right? You know, and, and weaken it so that you could somehow destroy it through either oxygen attacks or atrophy rules, things like that. There are ways to weaken the parasites, but having good parasite play is essential to making sure that you don't get left out of VPs. Because it can be difficult to make life, to find refugia that have the good kind of mana on them. That Because eventually events will come out that can the smites can destroy mana, and eventually there are enough of them to come out that refugia just go away because they run out of mana. If a smite event removes all the cubes on it, it just goes away. Um, there are a couple of refugia that are immune to that, especially in the uh, cosmic landforms here, like the inter interplanetary dust is immune to smites, so that's a pretty safe place to be in terms of smiting, not necessarily easy to make life. But to make life with enough chromosomes, the organized mana, that you have a strong organism that can survive a few Darwin rolls, because I've even had ones where I've had organisms I've brought into life, and I might have like two blue, a two green, and a red. I'm like, this is really strong. And then I roll like four sixes. <laughs> and then I have to atrophy a bunch of stuff because I can only protect against two sixes here and I lose two chromosomes. Then the next round I suffer a heat effect and I don't have a red chromosome to block it. It can snowball on you very quickly. Um, yeah. This is a very fun game. I gotta say, it's really fun. There are a lot of moving parts. Uh, it's really not that complicated when you can start rolling through it. Um, it is just complicated in the sense that there are a lot of options. You know, making life, deciding when to convert to life, deciding when you have enough good organized mana up here, learning to sort of take the bionts and go places where you can get the most cubes. So, you know, green putting its bion here, well, there's only green or yellow mana available here, which means if you make life, you can only put on green or yellow chromosomes. Well, if you're already green, you know you're going to get a green chromosome when you create life because that's your, your bion's going to go on it, but you don't need a ton of extra green or yellow. You might need blues or reds to live, right? So you're not necessarily going to think this is a great place for a green player to go to. They're going to want to go somewhere maybe that gets a little more diversity of that, you know, of cubes. So like there's one that has a red. Here's one that's got blue and you know yellow on it. That's pretty nice. You need to think about that because when you form life, those initial chromosomes, especially in the first few turns as you're trying to... Uh, um, just survive Darwin rules and get your mutations on so you can start building enough prerequisites to build, you know, these sort of uh, marine uh, life, uh, marine life. It can be tough and you want to give yourself a good starting position. 
if you wait too long to create life and you get through most of the deck and you're in the Protozoic era where a lot of oxygen events are happening, uh, it's going to be very difficult to get to marine life or terrestrial life. You just won't have enough turns to get enough mutations, survive enough parasite attacks, survive enough rolls and all that jazz to get to this level. Once you do get to sort of the marine life though, uh, things get a little bit easier for you, just a little though. You don't have to make Darwin rules because it's assumed that your organism now is so sufficiently complex that it, it won't have problem uh, replicating itself. But you are subjected to cancer rules. So when you get to the Protozoic era, uh, Protozoic, I'm probably totally mispronouncing that, uh, you will come across cancer events. And these are like Darwin rules in the sense that you roll the dice and for every five or six you roll, it's like, it's like having when you have bacteria and you have to suffer these hereditary chromosome effects. You do suffer atrophies. Um, but if you roll a one, then you also generate energy just like you do in the bacteria. So you don't do Darwin rules every turn. You only are subjected to cancer rules, and cancer rules only come through events. So that's kind of the nice thing. If you make my uh, macro life, you no longer every turn have to make Darwin rules, which can be a way that your chromosome just withers away. Okay, That's the advantage of making micro life and, or macro life. I know I've totally left some things out. This is not a real detailed, I've sort of rambled on a little bit. I hope this has given you a little bit of an overview of how it works. Um, I didn't really go through the turn sequence too well. It's pretty It's pretty easy. Flip an event, resolve events, right? You go through there and resolve every event. It'll tell you if it's hot or cold or not. When you're done with that, you move your bions to various refugia that have come out. You then, once you've assigned them all, you determine who's in control of those refugia. You roll, for, you roll one set of dice for every refugia, not for every player. You determine the results. If you get doubles, you can make life. If there's any life on the table, then you do Darwin rolls, in which you try to see if any of them atrophy or make energy. After all that's done, you can then purchase mutations. After you've purchased mutations, you start over again. You flip over another card, resolve the events, assign bions, blah, 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 blah. You keep doing that over and over until you get to the very end when you get to the end of the deck. Okay. So yeah, that's Bios Genesis. Uh, kind of rambled on there for about an hour. I Maybe we'll put together a couple turns. I don't know, um, but it's a really fun game. I hope you enjoy it, and I hope this video was helpful.